And I uh, want to thank you for coming here today. My name is Mike. I serve as the pastor. And whether you came here because one of the babies you got drug here, your mom drug you here, either way, uh, we are glad you are here. There was a mom that said, or I was told she was coming in, saw the donut truck from a distance and started shouting because she was so excited. Either way, uh, we want you to feel special uh, today and honored. We have flowers. We have a few treats for you as well, just to thank you. Uh, for all that you do. Um, it does feel like we should give moms more than one day a year. Doesn't it feel that way, right? They give us so much. We are actually here, like, physically because of our moms, amen, right? They do so much for us, so we are going to dedicate this morning just to talk about moms and all that they do. Uh, there's a stat out uh, right now uh, in America that moms are currently, today, as of today, influencing 73.1 million children in America. That's a big deal. That's not a, yeah, you can clap for that. I mean, shoot, let alone. Um, they go unseen, unnoticed most of the time, and we just don't want to go through a Sunday acknowledging uh, what they are doing and all that God is doing through them. And so it's important for us to see, hey, there, this is uh, motherhood or celebrating moms. It's an unseen work. Uh, there's a few stats as well I have that moms typically, uh, newborn moms, uh, and even in our church, uh, usually my wife and I keep a steady count. There's around uh, 10 to 11 uh, moms expecting, and then we have usually five or six moms that had just had a newborn. A uh, typical new mom will sleep 900 less hours of sleep in a year. That's a long time. That's why you're so tired drinking coffee all the time. Um, they will change a newborn baby's diaper around 2,000 times in one year, unless his name is Ezra, that's mine, it's probably more. Or uh, they will rock a baby over 1,000 hours in the first year. It's a thankless work, is it not? Um, and just by a show of hands, how many mama's boys do we have in the crowd this morning? Raise your hand. Put your hand up. Hi, yeah, my hand's up. I see someone not raising it back. He's a mama's boy. Either way, uh, you're here today because you're a mama's boy. Whatever the case is, it is a thankless work, and we want to honor them. Now, some of this morning, I think, will be true for us uh, just as a group, which is this, that God gives us more than we can handle, so we find strength in him. Uh, this is a lie I think we listen to sometimes that, hey, God won't give you more than you can handle. Well, that's not necessarily true, that God won't give us more temptation than we can handle, and he'll give us a way out. But I believe God gives us more than we can handle, that we feel neck deep, that we feel too far in, that we don't know how we're going to handle or do this, and then God gives us strength. That this is true about motherhood, this is true about life in general, that in those moments of weakness, that God is the one who's going to give us strength, that we uh, will find ourselves in a scenario or situation, and we'll say, God, would you, would you help me? Now, this is true for every single one of us. It was Ray Pritchard, pastor, who said this, we all have a heritage, a family tree, a spiritual history, good or bad, and someone is influencing us. No one comes to Christ on his or her own. That we are all, and we'll say it this way, everyone is standing on someone's shoulders. Every single one of us, we are not who we are today without those around us. Whether it was your actual mom, a spiritual mom, a grandma, we'll talk about all that today. We are not who we are by ourselves on our own. God places people around us. He puts the right people at the right times in the right places. And there's a lot of us today. Uh, as you come in, and we're talking about moms, there's a, there's a lot of excitement for new moms. Uh, you're tired, you're exhausted, but you're loving every second. There's a lot of, for some of you, regret. We'll talk about that this morning. What do you do if you feel like you messed up as a mom? How are you supposed to handle some of that? You didn't get to be a mom. Felt like that opportunity was robbed of you. We're going to talk about that this morning as well. And then for some of us, um, you just have a lot of wounds around this idea of of being mom, and how does God speak to that, and how's he going to help us understand, hey, every single one of us is standing on someone's shoulders. We are not our own by our own, and this is true universally. I think about moms. Moms usually carry too much guilt and don't get enough credit, amen? I think that's true. I didn't get strong enough amen on that, amen, right? They don't, they don't get enough credit. They carry too much guilt there's too much weight, maybe too many mistakes. You feel like you're failing as a mom. You only get recognized when the kids screw up, not when they do well, right? You feel like, hey, there's a lot of guilt around this, and you don't get enough credit, right? 
And oftentimes we want to shed light on moms. And that's why some of us, like I said, we're mama's boy. You came in today, you know, and you feel like you want to honor them. I was uh, the youngest, so my older siblings would always say that I got away with everything as the youngest because that's why I'm a mama's boy. Either way, um, they don't get enough credit. So what we're going to do, I've titled today's message, A Mother's Faith. A Mother's Faith. What is a mother's faith? How is it impactful? What if you have it? What if you don't have it? And how are we supposed to operate as followers of Jesus if you have one and if you want to extend faith and what that looks like? So we're going to talk about that this morning. And my first point today is a mother's faith is a, pa- is a faith passed down, a faith passed down because there is a faith uh, that we're supposed to have. We're going to talk about that church word and it's supposed to be passed down and how do you receive it and what does it look like? So it says in 2 Timothy Ver, or chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, and this is the Apostle Paul. He is talking to a young pastor. He's brand new. Uh, the guy has planted. He started this church, Paul. He is writing back to this young pastor um, who has not, has not grown up in an ideal home situation. Um, his mother and his grandmother, they are followers of Jesus. His father is not, and so he's growing up in this home, and, the, and Paul writes this to Timothy. He said, I am reminded of your sincere faith or genuine faith. We're going to talk about that a lot this morning. A faith that first or dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, in your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you. So we're going to, we're going to talk about this and break this idea down of genuine faith. But first, what's important to notice is that he is calling out, hey, you have a faith in Jesus that is genuine, it is sincere, and it didn't just happen on your own. There was people who influenced you. Now, a lot of you would say, hey, I don't grow up or I have not grown up in an ideal home. It was a broken home. Had a mom, dad was absent, had a father, mom was absent. uh, Either way, what is true is this is true of this pastor at this church uh, named Timothy in Ephesus, that his father in Acts 16 is not a follower of Jesus, but his mother and his grandmother is. And so what is encouraging for us today is this, hey, wherever you come, however you come, that it's not always an ideal situation. To have a sincere and genuine faith in Jesus or impact for Jesus, you don't have to have an ideal home situation. That is very true. And then he says, your sincere faith. Now, what does this word faith mean? What does it mean? We throw it around a lot. We talk about faith in Jesus. Faith is simply this. It is the ability to choose. It's choosing to believe something despite what I can't see. I don't have the ability to see this, but I am trusting, I am believing in this despite some of my doubts. Now, here's what's also true about faith. Faith cannot be forced. It can't be forced. You can't manipulate it. You can't control it. You can't try to make someone, you can't force it on someone. Parents, all of them said amen, right? You can't force a faith on a child. You can't force a faith on your friend. You can't make them believe something. And this is why uh, Paul says this, hey, this is your sincere, meaning, hey, there's no question here. We know where you stand. Your sincere faith, it was, it was passed down. That grandma uh, or, you know, mom cannot uh, impute faith to us or give us faith that it must be embraced on our own. It cannot be forced. Now, how, how on earth do you pass down a faith? A passed down faith is caught more than taught. That sometimes we have to look at a situation as parents when you're trying to figure out how do we give faith or how do we uh, pass down a faith if we can't muster it up. It's between two, uh, two extremes in our minds. It's knowing, knowing when to step in and try to save the day as parents and depending on where they are. Or it's knowing when to let go and, and allowing God to change the heart. And saying, hey, I know when I should step in, I know when I should step out. A passed down faith, it's caught more than taught. A lot of parents, when we talk about uh, being a mom, you just feel this massive weight of, man, I don't feel like I'm the perfect picture. I don't feel like, I feel like I make mistakes. I feel like maybe I lose it sometimes on the kids in the car, throwing nuggets at them, whatever the case is. I don't feel like I, I model this all the time. Well, the important fact is this that it is caught more than taught, that it is consistency, it is not perfection. It is not that your kids would think that you are God or Savior, but you go to the one who is. 
that you don't have to have this perfection and you don't look at your parents and, and blame them for not being perfect. You want to see, hey, when they messed up, where did they go? How do, how do we find the middle of this? And it's asking God, right, as a, as a parent as well, not really knowing how all this works. It's asking God, when do I step in and save the day or when do I step back and allow for mistakes? It was Mickey Thigpen who said this, Every good thing in my life story begins with a praying mother. That the passing down of a faith, I think, starts with a mom or a mother figure who would pray. I was um, at a meeting on Monday night, and there was probably eight or ten of us, and beforehand there was uh, someone from our church, and she was there, and she looked at me, and she, we were talking about moms and this quote right here, and she said to me, I remember that I was on the prayer team for you when you were 16. Oh, what did you guys pray for? She said, prayed that God would get a hold of your heart. When I had a sports injury, she said, we were, I was praying for something like that, right? So here's what we have to think as well, that praying moms, it's not this insignificant, unseen impact that feels vague or separate from. It is very involved. I can still remember uh, when I was in high school that I would come home and maybe I was doing something, not maybe, I was doing something probably I shouldn't. Um, I was coming home late and I was hoping, you know, hope mom's sleeping and where would she be? She'd just be off in the corner sitting in that rocking chair just waiting for me coming through the door. Probably what? She was praying. That prayer is where God is going to work, that we would call upon him for him to soften a heart. We see a pass down faith. And number two, we see a faith that stays, or a trust, a faith, or dependence, or belief in God that stays. We see in John 19, 26 to 27, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. This is significant because this is one of the last seven sayings that Jesus had on the cross. When Jesus is on the cross, he has seven things recorded that he would say. He found it to be of utmost importance to take care of who? His mother. You see, a lot of times people think that Christianity would put down the view of women. It is actually the opposite. It would uphold the opinion or the weight of a woman. You see, even at the cross, there was, it says, his mother, the disciple whom he loved, that's John, there's two, there's another one recorded, three, and the rest have went MIA. Where are they at in G with Jesus at the lowest moment of his life dying on the cross? She stays. You see, Mary, Mary is the, one of the last at the cross or the crucifixion, and she is the first to what? The tomb. That when Jesus would rise from the dead, she's the one that's come running. You see, a mom, a mom, we'll say it this way, shows up. When most leave, that when some people, there is, and it's not naiveness, right? It is this, it is called gospel optimism. It's showing up when most have left. It's a faith that stays. And for moms, what we always say is this, hey, it's, and when you have a, a son or a situation or a daughter or things where you're saying, hey, this doesn't look good. I don't know how I can trust God. When do I stay? When do I leave? We often say this, hey, we respond and act as when God is going to move, not if. Because even in a story in the Bible, there is a son who takes his father's blessings and he runs. It's the story of the prodigal son. And when he runs away, he realizes, hey, I need to go back home to my family. Or the, the spiritual implication is go back to God. And when he does, the father is standing, looking over the hill, waiting for him to come home. You want to know why? Because parents or moms, they, they show up when almost everybody has left. It is gospel optimism. Hey, when God is going to move, that not, not if. It is a faith that stays. And number three is this, a faith with open hands. And hopefully this morning, this is probably going to be the most practical one, I hope, for us. But a faith with open hands. It says in Luke 8, 19 to 21, Then his mother and his brothers came to him. But they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he, being Jesus, answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Can you imagine just for a moment what Mary was feeling? Jesus is just now really ramping up public ministry, 
People are wanting to be around him. They're wanting to see him and touch him and heal themselves. They're, they're, all this is happening. Jesus is, is doing this. Mary and the family show up. Hey, we're here to see my son. We're here to interact with him and talk with him. Go get him for me. So, you know, they run over, come back. Hey, he said, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Imagine what she feels. That's my son. Tell him mom wants to talk to him, right? What's he doing, right? Can you imagine what this is feeling? Now, Jesus is teaching this principle, that obedience is thicker than blood, or obedience is blood in God's kingdom. That really the defining factor is not that we are uh, born naturally or connected. That's not doing any significance. What's doing or what's happening here is this. Hey, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, there's what's called a spiritual birth. That it's not just a natural birth. Now, Mary is learning this principle. I think every single parent needs to know it's this. This is my child, but he is not mine. This is my child. But he is not mine, or she is not mine. It's an open-handed faith. It's an open-handed trust that we, you know, when people come up and dedicate their kids to the Lord, and, and we see them, and th what they're saying is this, is, hey, this is my child, the one whom I've been entrusted with. But God, God, I believe you love and you care more for my son or daughter than I ever possibly could. This is your child that you've, you've entrusted to me. I don't know how all this works. I don't know how this is going to look like. I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know how I get strength for the day. But this is my child, but he is not mine. You've given me stewardship for a season. Would you help me? Would you, would you give me wisdom? It's coming to God in that way. All parents or all moms must hand off their kids to God because God loves them more than we ever could. Or we'll also say it this way. Open-handed faith is about loving and knowing when to leave. It's about loving and knowing when to leave. Can you imagine again in the passage in Luke 8, Mary wrestling in her mind with how, how does this work? I thought I was responsible. What is taking place here? Is he mine? Is he not? Because what Jesus is teaching, hey, if you want to be family, you must hear the word of God and do it. That it is a responsibility of the individual for faith. Open-handed faith is saying, hey, I'm going to love and do the best with what I have, with where I am knowing that eventually I have to step away and say, God, this is, this is your child. Because as parents, as parents, one of, one of the most significant things we ever do for God might not be something we do, but a child we raise. Might be someone you've entrusted to us. Hey, how am I taking the care of this? What am I, what am I supposed to do? And a mother's labor, right, or, or work goes unseen and unnoticed today, but not in eternity. The Bible says this, what is seen is temporary or earthly among you. Hey, what is unseen is eternal. Hey, God, wherever you've placed me, whatever you've given me, whatever you put around me, would you help me to have open hands? Oftentimes, in, in anything in our life, we come to God like this. We're holding on to something. We're holding on to someone. We're holding on to a, a family member, a friend, a situation in our life. And God says, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's loosen the grip and let go. God says, I got this, and to believe the fact that God would love our kids more than we ever could. It's an open-handed faith. And number four, it's a faith with open arms. That God would have open arms, or that we would have open arms with the kids that he's entrusted to us. It says in Psalm 68, verses 5 to 6, that God is this. He's a father to the fatherless, he's a defender of widows. That's important to notice that God looks at the least and those who are in the deficit. He is a defender of them. This is God whose dwelling is holy, and God places the lonely in families. Here's how this works, and as we're talking about this, that for us, for those that might think, hey, I don't, I don't have any kids, there is this mindset or that the Bible gives that in God's family or in the church that you have spiritual parents. They have people who are caring for you, that God takes lonely people and he places them in a family. And we'll say it this way, that God doesn't plant you in a church. He places you in a family. And it, we, we say all the time, hey, this isn't just a service to attend or something to be a part of, that, hey, this is a family to belong to, that we want you to be known and needed and cared for, that this is what happens. Now, because it's Mother's Day, there are a few of us, a few of us, 
you carry, you carry this weight of guilt or, hey, man, I, I've messed up as a parent. I made wrong decisions at the wrong time. Um, I'm carrying this guilt. And what is always to be reminded is this. When we're talking about this idea of mothering and parents and all this, is that God was the perfect, what, parent. And he had the two perfect kids without sin nature, Adam and Eve, in the perfect, what, environment in the garden. And they still chose wrong. That sometimes as parents, you can't carry the weight or the guilt of, hey, I messed up, that I need to do what I need to do, what is best at the moment, that the proverb that we prayed even as we started, that we would train up a child in the way they should go. And then what? Even when they're old, they won't depart. We need to be reminded, hey, that is a proverb, meaning this. It is true most of the time. It is not a promise that we can control someone else's actions, that we say, hey, God, where I am today, where I, wh with who you have in front of me, would you help me to see, to see how I'm supposed to respond and love and care for those you've placed within my arms? And the open arms that we have is this, as parents, we say, hey, who do you have me to, who do you want me to welcome in? And for those who are hurting, we look at God as he welcomes us in. That he sees us where we are broken. If we're talking about the widow. We're talking about the one who's lost. We're talking about those who are lonely. Hey, would, he welcomes them in. It is an open-armed faith. And then number five is this. It is a heavenly faith. A heavenly faith that we will talk about in Luke chapter 11, verses 27 to 28. A woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, so Jesus is doing miracles here. Um, he's doing a lot of stuff. And there's a woman who raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed, which is kind of a weird compliment. Never was playing football at Mogador. Someone scored a touchdown. They're like, who nursed that boy, right? That's never happened to my knowledge. But either way, that's what's going on, that the breast at which you nursed. But he said, right, and he comes back, just like in Luke chapter 8, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Jesus is teaching this principle. Hey, it's not about natural birth. It's not if you're, like we said in the start, not like if your grandma was a follower of Jesus or your mom was a follower of Jesus or your granddad was a follower. It's not any of that or your brother or sister. It's, hey, blessed are those who hear the word, meaning this, a follower of Jesus, and they keep it or do it. It is not the keeping or doing that bring us faith to Jesus. It is the evidence that the faith exists, that God is not looking for, as we even talk about Mother's Day, God is not looking for external cosmetics, but internal, in our heart, transformation. As we said in the beginning, he says this, your sincere faith, your genuine faith, sincere is authentic, it's real, it's inside, it's deep. Faith is this trust. I'm going to believe in God. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for or things yet seen. That is this faith in God. And then he says, even backwards, it's yours. Hey, the question we need to ask ourselves, is this, is this ours? Is this our faith? Because mothers teach their children a lot about God. And kids, they teach their parents a lot about God. It has a lot to do with this. Whether you have one, whether you don't, whether you're in the deficit, whatever the case is, that there is a heavenly faith. And the heavenly faith is when we put our faith and trust or dependence on the work of Jesus and who he said he was. That Jesus, all of these interactions uh, teaching others, it was this, saying, hey, Jesus is saying, hey, my mom can't get you to heaven. Being a good mom can't get you to heaven. Having a mom can't get you to heaven. It's, hey, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed rather are those who come to me and believe and put their faith in Jesus. This is your sincere, genuine faith. Everyone is standing on someone's shoulders. Everyone, We are not who we are by ourselves. But at, at some point in time, we must come to say, do I have sincere and genuine faith. And in the midst of all of that, and doubt, and being scared, and the fear, and what that looks like, Jesus says, hey, this is not about natural family. This is about a spiritual family. 
that he takes lonely people and he places us in a family. And he talks about this heavenly faith. And we'll say it this way, that God has open hands and he places you on them. And God has open arms and he invites you in. So he has open hands and he takes us and he places us right on them. And he has open arms like this and he invites us in. That he takes us as we are in faith. The motivator or the thing that produces faith is this idea of love. That God sacrifices himself for us while we were yet sinners. Faith is, is produced by love. That even though we were abandoned on our own, by our own choice, God takes us in as we are. And we'll end with this in, he, or in Isaiah 49. 14 to 19, it says this. Some people would say this. It says Zion, or some people would say, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord ha my Lord has forgotten me. Some people feel that way about God. Even in church, you might today say, hey, it feels like God's forsaken me, he's forgotten me. And then it, you'll ask this question. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she have no compassion on the son of her womb? Can that happen? It says this, though she may forget I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. I have engraved you right here. That God takes the lonely and he places them right here. He sees you hurt, whether you've been abandoned, whether you've been forgotten, whether you feel like, hey, my life feels like a mess and it's not ideal. It's not the perfect situation. I feel like I don't hear from God. I feel like this isn't, this isn't a normal thing for me. He says, hey, I want to welcome you in. I want to place you right here on the palms of of my hands. This is God and this is what he does. I want to end with this quote. It says this. There's been a debate for years. What is the goal of the sermon, the talk, the lesson when we come together? What's the goal? Should it be application or doctrine? Lecture or practical? What should we get? Martin Lloyd Jones, he was a preacher in the 18th century, he was asked this and he said neither of these are the goal. The goal of the lecture is you leave with a page full of notes, and the goal of a motivational sermon is you leave with a page full of action steps, but the goal of preaching the gospel is you leave worshiping, that there comes a time in the sermon when the pen goes down and the eyes go up and the hands go up and you realize, wow, this is not about what I need to do for God. Look what God has done for me. And in that moment of wonder, that's when you change and that's when you transform. The goal of the sermon is not to tell you the 10 best steps of being a mom or a parent. It's to show you the 10 billion steps God has took to get to us. And in that moment, when you change, that's when you become a better mom or better parent. Would you guys stand as I pray for us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that we would have a sincere and genuine faith in Jesus. God, that as for a lot of us seeking to pass it down, I pray you'd give us wisdom. And Lord, for those who are hurting today, we pray that you would bring healing. And for those who need help today, we ask that you would aid them and help them. And Lord, we pray that for those who are lonely, they'd be reminded that you place us in a family. And God, we pray that the moms would feel so loved and honored today. And Lord, we thank you for all that you do and all God's people said. Amen.